But let me challenge you to think this way. Even when it comes to your convictions, don't call how you feel a conviction from God. Your feelings are not a conviction from God. Those are just feelings. Our feelings are to be taken to the Word of God, compared to them, and then submitted to His Word. Welcome to the Truth Point Podcast, where we equip the church and engage the culture by connecting truth in God's Word to the people, values, issues, and ideas in God's world. Should we even celebrate holidays as Christians? I mean, let's have the conversation. Sometimes we get caught up in things and we don't slow down enough to even ask a deep question like, does it honor and glorify God when we celebrate holidays? Is there a difference between celebrating holidays in general and celebrating particular and specific holidays individually. How should a disciple of Jesus in modern day America evaluate this question? How do we please God? What does God's word say about it, if anything? One of the things that I'm so excited about is as I study God's word, I see that his idea is the idea of celebration. That feast where we celebrate, where we put aside the work and the regular everyday life mundane routine and worship him and focus on him, it comes from him. Starting all the way back in Exodus chapter 12, whenever God is sending them out at Passover, he establishes right there that this is to be a statute forever. But then in Leviticus 23, throughout all the generations of the nation of Israel, It says, God gives seven feasts here. God gives seven feasts for them to observe and proclaim worship of the one true God. It's so cool that God doesn't simply say, give me the words, God is good. Or, hey, praise you, God, you're so wonderful. But that he delights and takes joy in our joy and celebration of his goodness, of his presence, of his faithfulness in our life. Celebration is something we were created to do. Why do unbelievers celebrate things? Why do they even want to? Because God has created us as beings of worship, beings who overflow from the inside and desire to enjoy life. That's because all people are created in the image of God. And whether or not you choose to believe in him, to worship him, to give him your life, there is an inward desire to celebrate and worship. Isn't that so cool? I want you to notice in Leviticus chapter 23 that God prescribes very specific ways in which the people are to worship him. Some of the feasts have to do with afflicting your soul and fasting and and you kind of do the fasting thing and then you feast at the end. They're very sober and a reminder of our brokenness and our sinfulness and our need for a savior. Other feasts are proclaiming in great joy, put aside the sackcloth and ashes and rejoice Don't fast and weep, but feast and enjoy the goodness and the gifts that God has given. God has a plan, and it's so wonderful. Most people don't realize that the seven feasts in Leviticus 23 foreshadow God. You can do some study on your own, and I'll put a link to an article below that gives you at least a brief outline of what those feasts in the Old Testament are and what they represent and how they connect to Christ and really how God fulfilled them in Jesus when he came. Some, including in this article, have said the first four feasts were fulfilled at Christ's first coming when he came to die on the cross for our sins and rose again, and that the final three feasts will be fulfilled at his second coming when he comes down to earth and reigns for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom. Regardless, God did not simply put feasts for no reason. He didn't create celebrations just to simply have a celebration, but to direct our gaze toward him, to take our hearts and our minds our hearts and our minds off of the things here and now and to redirect them towards him. Because listen, brothers and sisters, it's so important that we understand everything in our life is about him. From the time that we sleep to the time that we get up in the morning, to how we go to work, to the friends, to the leisure, all of it is to be honoring to him. So important that we see that. But I want you to kind of step back for just a minute, and I want you to think about this. Does God tell us just to celebrate generically, as in whatever comes your way, and as cultures and time, you know, shift, because obviously these feasts 
were for the ethnic group of the Jews, the, the Jewish people, an actual physical nation. They're not prescribed for us. Jesus fulfilled all those things when he came. But the question is, what are the principles and practices that we can learn from how they did the feast there and apply them to how we live our lives today? There is so much richness in God's word, and I hope that you spend some time studying yourself and going through God's word to really decide what it is that it says to see how he would direct your heart to celebrate. And maybe there are some holidays that you shouldn't celebrate, or other people talk about the idea of redeeming a holiday. There is a whole conversation surrounding that. But my question to you, at least initially, is does God want us to celebrate holidays? By the way, where does the word holidays even come from? What does it mean? It simply means holy days. They are days that are set apart, days that are sanctified for something very special, something very specific. I think we've lost that in many of our cultural celebrations. But for you and for me as individual followers of Jesus, we don't have to lose that. We can take seriously the call to worship. Let me encourage you to think about four things that will help you set up a biblical framework, a biblical structure for how you should celebrate holidays. Four questions that I want you to ask yourself. First of all, what are you celebrating? What are you celebrating? At Christmas, as an example, what are you celebrating? At Halloween, what is being celebrated? Second question, why are you celebrating? So we've talked about what you're celebrating. Now maybe dealing with the motives of why am I celebrating this? Why am I compelled? What is it about this particular thing that draws me to celebrate it in particular? Third question, how am I celebrating? So we've got what are you celebrating? Why are you celebrating it? How are you celebrating? Because you can have what is being celebrated be good and how you're celebrating it be wrong, right? Meaning you can violate principles and truths and laws of God's in how you're celebrating, even if you were celebrating a good thing. That was an example. There was an example of that in the Old Testament. And the children of Israel would combine pagan worship practices with worship of God. Think about how gross that is. It's idolatry. It's filthy. You must worship God in spirit and in truth. So by application, we could celebrate the right holiday or the right thing, but we can celebrate it wrongly if it dishonors God or violates something in his word. And then the last question to help us build a biblical framework for if we should and how we should celebrate holidays, here's the last question. Does the way that you celebrate point people to Jesus. We are called to be salt and light. We're not called to do things on our own. We're not called to live for God in a vacuum. We're called to live for him in the midst of a world that needs Jesus. So the last question to create this structure and this framework for how should we celebrate is, does the way you celebrate, do your traditions and practices point people to Jesus? So important. Let me give you an example. Suppose someone were to ask you about Christmas and you were to say, well, we celebrate the birth of Christ. And they say, well, how do you do that? Well, we just give gifts to each other. Okay, but unbelievers give gifts to each other. And do they even know why? Because a lot of times, to be honest, Christmas from a cultural perspective is just a spirit of generosity, human goodness at its best, right? And we've talked about that recently, that human goodness isn't really all that good, right? That there's an inherently corrupt aspect of our nature that even the good in us is corrupted deep within because of our sinfulness. All right, so here's the four questions one more time. What are you celebrating? Why are you celebrating? How are you celebrating? And is the way that you're celebrating pointing people to Jesus? Because they are watching. It's so cool that God has given us ideas that we can think through. And let me challenge you, pray, fast, seek godly counsel, read God's word for yourself, and really ask God to shape 
how you worship, how you celebrate things. Lord, should I celebrate these holidays? Why should I? Why shouldn't I? Show me from your word. If I'm going to celebrate them, God, show me from your word what I should celebrate. And God, show me how to point people to you, even if it's your own family. Is your own family edified and built up and pointed back to God's love and God's grandeur and his beauty and his wonder and glory because of the way that your family celebrates? so important that we consider these things. And honestly, brothers and sisters, if you were to consider these things and you were to seek God, I promise you, because he desires to reveal himself to you, because he wants you to celebrate, because he wants you to walk in joy, and because he wants to bless you in so many different things, he will answer your question and he will show you. And I want you to think about this. It's going to take time to slow down. Often we're so busy that we don't have time to think about these kind of things. But let me just encourage you. There are good podcasts out there. Go for some prayer walks. Again, spend some devoted and specific time. There are some good articles online you can find. And really pray through how God would have you do this. I'm telling you, these holidays can be such a sweet and powerful time of worship, relaxation, enjoyment that give honor and glory to God, that build up and encourage others, and that even win people to Christ. But they can also be something that dishonors God or sort of dismisses him as if it's not that big of a deal. I would encourage you. Some people say that it's about a matter of conviction. All right. Again, we've talked about this before, particularly in the video on Halloween. But let me challenge you to think this way. Even when it comes to your convictions, don't call how you feel a conviction from God. Your feelings are not a conviction from God. Those are just feelings. Our feelings are to be taken to the word of God, compared to them, and then submitted to his word, whatever it may say. So I really encourage you and really challenge you. I think that there are some holidays we can celebrate with great joy. I think about Valentine's as an example. Most people don't even realize the history of Valentine's Day and how it's connected to a Christian martyr who was, or who was killed because he was marrying people when the government had outlawed it. But he believed that marriage was a God-given, God-ordained right, and he blessed and honored people by marrying them secretly. And ultimately, as he preached the gospel to the emperor, it cost him his life. Or how about St. Patrick's Day to honor a brother who gave up his life to go back to a place where he had been a slave as a kid, and he left his home after being made free, and he preached the gospel to Ireland. And so they honor him. Those are rich, powerful things, examples of what God does in people's lives and through people's lives. And we would do well. We should take the time to investigate those things and know why we're celebrating what we're celebrating and submit it to the Lord. When it comes to things like Halloween, Halloween to me is clearly something that is so evil and there's so much evidence and it's getting more evil. And I'm not just talking about the history and some of those conversations. I'm talking about right now, right now modern day Halloween practices are evil and dark and satanic. Some people would say, well, should we just give up and walk away and, and give Satan, you know, his show? No, we don't. But at the same time, we don't participate in his show either and pretend like it's all good because it's just cute with little costumes. We are to be salt and light. And I think what we should be doing is reverberating God's truth and God's life and God's light into the darkness. You should not be celebrating death, fear, blood, witchcraft. All of these things are wrong. They go against what God says. But can you, on that night, as people come to your house, give them the gospel and love on them, give them cider or hot dogs or other things, and tell them, perhaps about Martin Luther, it's Reformation Day, the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, that launched the Protestant Reformation. Can we talk to people about these things in a way that doesn't celebrate, doesn't look like, doesn't even resemble the filthiness of the world and the cultural practices, and yet at the same time clearly shines light into the darkness? That as people come to us, we welcome them and share with them the truth of God's word. So as we kind of wrap this up and as we enter into this holiday season, I want to challenge you today to consider the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice what it says in verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, 
do it all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. And we know what that looks like by reading his word. So God bless you. God loves you. He died for you. And he desires to give you an abundant life. And that abundant life does not come apart from worship and obedience in spirit and in truth. This has been the Truth Point Apologetics Podcast, where we equip the church and engage the culture by connecting truth in God's word to the people, values, issues, and ideas in God's world. 